Hey, there we are. All right. So, figure painting with Mike Roof. Uh, all right, so uh, good, good morning still. Um, I'm Mike Roof, um, and uh, for the next uh, hour and a half or so, I'm um, hopefully talk to you to and, uh, explain my technique for uh, figure painting um, and uh, maybe uh, show you some things that uh, you might not uh, already be doing and uh, hopefully not uh, patronize those of you who are uh, already doing it too bad. So, uh, next slide. So this is the agenda. I have a lot of information that I'd like to cover with you. Um, there's a lot of stuff uh, to talk about um, uh, beforehand uh, to sort of set the stage for the actual uh, physical process of painting the figures. And so there's kind of some background information that we need to go over to put the, the painting process into the context of, uh, of painting. So there's a lot of stuff to cover. Hopefully uh, we'll be able to get over it all uh, without running too far over time. So next. Okay, what I'm going to show you is uh, just one of many various uh, figure painting techniques. It's a technique that works for me. Um, <clears throat> one thing to keep in mind, if you're a, uh, a novice or a, a advancing figure painter, is that uh, the medium that's used for figure painting generally drives the technique. That is, guys that paint with acrylics have certain techniques that really only apply to acrylic painting. Guys that paint with hobby enamels, uh, there's some blending with those techniques with oils, and then guys that paint with oils, a lot of the techniques that uh, are used for oil painting, for blending and stuff like that, really don't translate back to painting with acrylics. And so the color theory and things like that is, is universal, but the specific techniques are often driven by the particular medium. And so if I'm showing you the, the way I paint, the way I paint is driven by the medium that I use, which is oils over acrylics. And so some of what I'm going to show you may be applicable to what you do if you use a different medium. And uh, some of it uh, may not be. And if it doesn't apply, don't uh, kind of freak out and say, oh, well, I've been doing it wrong all this time. Or, uh, you know, Mike's uh, really screwed up because that doesn't, that doesn't work at all for me. Um, just, just keep in mind that, it, again, it, uh, medium drives a technique. So not all uh, techniques transfer across mediums. Uh, these are the ones that work for me. And uh, I'm really only going to just touch on to the pre-painting considerations so that we can concentrate on the actual painting process. So there's a lot of pre-painting stuff that happens before you actually put paint onto your figures. But we're just going to breeze over that. <coughs> Next. Oh, and feel free to ask questions at any time or you know, raise your hand and interject a comment or something like that. It's uh, much more interesting if everybody uh, is involved. Are you going to put these on your uh, club's website for access? Uh, we will, but Pete is also recording all of this, and uh, I, I won't see Pete's thunder, but as I understand it, uh, they're looking at like uh, AMP's YouTube channel, yeah. so all of these uh, presentations are going to be available to watch on uh, YouTube, so go home and sit in your underwear and drink beer and... How do you know? Throw popcorn into your screen. You know, Where it's make fun of Mike. CVC and underwear. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever makes you happy. <laughs> Amps, Amps is here to help you. So, uh, <clears throat> it's beyond the scope of this presentation to discuss the pros and cons. You know, figure, uh, plastic figures are better than this, or resin figures, or metal figures, or any of that. Uh, the painting is painting is painting. Once, you, once you've primed it, it's all the same. Uh, all figures can be painted well, just some figures are easier to paint than others. So, a well sculpted figure is easier to paint than a figure that's not sculpted uh, as well. And that sort of goes back to generally uh, resin figures, high quality, high end resin figures are generally sculpted and have a lot crisper detail and stuff like that. And it's easier to paint those. Uh, it doesn't make them better. It doesn't mean that you can't take a plastic figure and accomplish the same thing. Um, so all figures can be painted well. It doesn't really matter what the, the, the material is that they're made of. But the better the sculpting, the easier it is to paint. Next. So, the uh, presentation here, I'm going to uh, use uh, this Arsenal 35 figure as my example throughout the uh, entire presentation. Um, I selected this figure <clears throat> because it has good anatomy and good proportions. And, uh, you know, if, if you select a figure that's all goofy, you know, his hands are too big, or his head's too small, or his equipment isn't correctly sized for the scale of the figure, no amount of painting will fix that. So... You know, start with good figures if you want 
a, a well-painted, nice uh, presentation at the end. Uh, on this figure, the detail is accurate, um, which is something that really is important to me, uh, and uh, is a Commonwealth figure, and uh, Commonwealth LCE from World War II, their webbing equipment and stuff like that, almost no one gets it right, um, because it's overly complicated, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, but this particular figure is actually quite accurate. And the production quality is very high. You know, no pinholes and stuff like that, so it was easy to work with. Please? Thanks. So, <clears throat> cleanup and uh, preparation. Uh, good fit is essential to a good finished painted figure. Um, but, you know, you're just going to use the, uh, you know, the standard techniques, cut, scrape, grind, file, sand, whatever. Uh, 4 <coughs> steel wool. Uh, works quite well for uh, buffing out and polishing up the tooling marks that you leave with your cutting, scraping, grinding, filing, and sanding. So you can cut, scrape, file, grind, and sand, uh, and, but you'll still have those little small scratches, and a uh, 4 steel world works real well for uh, buffing those things out. A smooth fit, check your parts on your fit of your parts, especially as you're planning your uh, painting project, and uh, you say, well, I want to you know, leave this arm unattached so I can paint particular area and I want to reattach this arm or attach that arm later, if you don't have to go back and do a lot of uh, cutting and filling, um, it'll make the painting process a lot easier. So good fit up front, good dry fit and things like that are important, um, just like uh, building your regular models. Thanks. So <clears throat> once I have the parts uh, cleaned up and ready um, and whatever assembly that I'm going to do, I uh, get them ready for priming. And uh, priming is uh, something that I do with uh, figures. I don't ne necessarily always prime my armor models, but I always prime my figure models. <clears throat> and I've gone through a thousand and one different things that I use for priming. And my old favorite used to be the Flocal uh, Light Gray Primer, um, which works really well. Um, but I have learned through trial and error that really all I absolutely need is a flat coat of white paint. And so what I use now is I just use an airbrush coat of Tamiya flat white, and that's what I prime with. Um, nothing special. So I clean the parts up, I, I do all the assembly and pre-assembly that I'm gonna do. I decide what's gonna be left unattached or, or separate for attachment later. Uh, I use these little toothpicks um, with a piece of tape wrapped around them backwards. What's your airbrush? Specs on thinning. What do you use to thin them? The, the, Tamiya. The Tamiya. Yeah. Uh, I generally use for all my uh, Tamiya airbrushing. I use a uh, about a 60/40 to 70/30 ratio of paint to thinner. Uh -huh. And for the thinner, I use a mixture of about 50/50, uh, either Tamiya X20A, which is IPA, isopropyl alcohol, and lacquer thinner, ordinary hardware store lacquer thinner. So I use a Tamiya thinner, but I've also used uh, the 90% IPA, isopropyl alcohol, and again, mix that with uh, lacquer thinner, ordinary hardware store lacquer thinner. About a 50-50 ratio for that, and then I use that at about 60% uh, paint, 70% paint to 30-40% thinner. What's the reason for adding the um, lacquer thinner to the... <coughs> to the Tamiya paint? Yeah. Uh, no, it's to the... To the Tamiya thinner, uh, you're putting both the the, the Tamiya thinner. Uh, what you need to do, this is you know we're really getting off. Yeah, off, yeah, we're sure. getting off the uh, going off on a real tangent right here. But what happens is you need to uh, you need to balance the uh, drying uh, uh, properties of the right. paint uh, as it's atomized, and that depends on the conditions that you you're painting in. And so in my house, the average temperature and the average humidity in the air, that gives me a good uh, uh, drying property so that the paint doesn't dry too fast, but doesn't dry too slow. And the IPA I found dries a little too fast. Yeah. Ordinary lacquer thinner, straight up lacquer thinner, uh, it dries, but it doesn't dry quite fast enough for my, for my personal taste. So it's just what works for me. Great, thank you. Okay, so anyways, flat white. So another thing uh, to keep in mind uh, with figure paintings is references. Um, just like with your armor models, uh, there is no shortage of references for figures. And uh, so because there's no shortage of references, there's very few excuses for getting things wrong with figure painting. 
Um, the references are available. Uh, and again, it depends on your personal tolerance for accuracy. I'm uh, a rivet counter, and I'm unapologetic about it. <laughs> so, so I spend a lot of time worrying about these things. Uh, you know, is the buckle the right shape or whatever? Is the button got the right thing on it? Uh, but it, in the end, don't forget, if you do, uh, if you're a figure modeler, don't forget that that AMPS uh, research bonus applies to figures. So do your research, present your stuff to the judges, and you should get that half point. Easy picking. So enough on references. You can get it right or don't. It's up to you. So <clears throat> my technique. What I do is I paint in uh, artist oils over acrylics. And so generally speaking, my process after priming is I fully paint the figure with acrylic paints. And I generally use Vallejo or Citadel or uh, Reaper or whatever. There's a thousand and one uh, acrylic paints that are, are, are very similar in formulation and uh, application. Um, <clears throat> those form the final colors for some parts, but mostly what they're doing is they're providing me an undercoat so that if I brush through or blend through the oils, I don't uh, wind up with that white primer showing through. The white primer, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention it. The white primer is good because the white allows the colors that you put on the figure later to show true. So you're seeing the actual shade and, and color as opposed to using a gray or a black. Um, a lot of uh, small scale uh, work, tabletop wargaming uh, figure painters use black and that's really kind of a pre-shading process for them. Um, but uh, for larger scale figures, I think that uh, white or a light gray at the very least. Um, but gray, even gray, will, will uh, tend to alter the, the final color some. But if, you, if you're used to doing it, then you can work with it. Uh, the acrylics allow uh, mistakes with the oils to be removed with mineral spirits without burning through all the way again back down to that white primer. Uh, in some places, uh, you can use a, a dark oil wash uh, on top of the acrylics and uh, as a part of a kind of a pre-shading thing. I'll show you that a little bit later. And the acrylics are amenable to that. The, uh, the mineral spirits in the oil paint used to create the wash won't lift that acrylic paint. So acrylic undercoats. Uh, the final colors, uh, white oils. Oils uh, give us a very long working time for blending. Uh, and I am uh, slow and meticulous, and uh, so that suits me. Uh, other guys are, are fast and they're free form, and uh, acrylic painting, uh, really the best acrylic painters are guys that, that are like that. They, they're, they're able to move quickly and they move fast, and they're able to uh, do that layering uh, technique, and um, so that works for them, but, but I, I can't paint like that. I've tried, and it just doesn't work for me personality-wise, temperament-wise. So the long working time works for me. And uh, an infinite variety of colors for blending. Um, a lot of people uh, are afraid of oils because of the whole idea of blending and, and creating your own color. But uh, actually, once you crack the code, which is not that difficult, uh, it's quite liberating. Because in the end, it opens up everything to you. And you have uh, an infinite uh, a variety of colors and shades to vary things with. Um, and uh, if you advance in your figure painting skill, you'll find that uh, that's very useful. Um, once, you, once you get beyond a certain point, you want to get beyond that, you know, what is a Vallejo color code paint that matches German field gray, okay? That's okay out of the bottle, but now we want to do something a little bit different because we have 25 figures made and we want to vary it some. And in the end, uh, oil paints, if you have some uh, final little shine or sheen left over, uh, then, you know, a black coat of a dull coat or something will uh, take care of that. Next, please. So, quickly, prime them, acrylic undercoats, and then the final artist uh, oil color coats over the top of that. So that's sort of the, the three major painting steps. Go ahead. So, we already talked about the priming. Don't need to go back and beat that uh, horse anymore. Uh, for the undercoating, uh, painting with acrylics, proper thinning is the key to, to painting with acrylics. They, they generally are supplied by the manufacturers that are formulated uh, rather heavy. 
And uh, in order to put that heavy paint onto uh, your models, you really do need to thin it so that you control uh, how heavy the coats are, the opacity, the color, and things like that. Um, so uh, proper thinning is a key to painting with acrylics. Um, what I use is I use a, a mixture uh, that sounds rather complicated, um, and uh, perhaps it is, I don't know. Uh, but anyways, this is what I use. I use uh, water and Vallejo thinner. The Vallejo thinner is basically uh, an acrylic matte medium, uh, which you can buy in large volume if you uh, so desire. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, then I add, uh, after I mix that up one to one, I add 5% uh, uh, by volume of a retarder and a uh, flow aid. And I mix that up in a, uh, a little bottle that I keep on my painting desk so I don't have to formulate it every time. And it's really easy to do, basically. I just take a bottle of Vallejo thinner, dump it in there, I fill it up with water, dump it in there, and I got one to one. And then I, <laughs> I just dribble in some uh, retarder and uh, flow aid, shake it up, and it's good to go. So, uh, for the actual painting, uh, I use uh, these little uh, color cups, like the Game Little Paint by Number sets. You can buy those empty in any craft store. They come in a bag, and you just cut them apart off the little uh, tree. You can write on the top of them, you know, what your colors are, and the mixers that you make up, and uh, you can wash those out and reuse them too later if you're really cheap. Uh, and I use about a one-to-one -one mixture of this thinner with the colors. And that gives me about the right, about the right consistency. Um, and it's not rocket science, sometimes it's a little, little thinner, and sometimes a little thicker. Next. So, brushes. Now that we've got the paint ready, we need to use the right kind of brush. And uh, so for thin acrylics or oil washes, I use sable liners. And a sable liner uh, gives us a lot of brush with a small point, and the body of the bristles is, is, gives us enough uh, oil, uh, paint holding capacity, if you will, so that the paint can flow out of the bristles. So we have this really thin paint, one-to-one -one or a wash, and we want that paint to flow out like ink from a, an old uh, ink pen. And we want that paint to flow out, and so we want to have enough paint on the brush to be useful so as it's flowing out, you know, it's draining out of the bristles, so we need enough bristles so we have enough paint, so that we're not killing ourselves trying to paint something. Um, but we also want a you know, small enough point uh, or tip on the uh, bristles that uh, you know, we can get in and control where we're putting the paint. So I use 10 Sable liner brushes. Uh, other people use different things, this is what works for me. Next. Now for the actual oil painting, because the paints are thick and heavy in consistency, now we, we're, we're taking the paint and we're going to use the mechanical action of the bristles to spread the paint. So now we need not necessarily short stubby bristles, but that long bristle is not, not, not what we're looking for. We're looking for a short uh, bristle that has some spring in it that will allow us to push and spread the paint where we want it. Instead of flowing it like ink, we're going to push and spread it. So we're going to use short round uh, sables. Sable detailers. Uh, for thinning my oil paint, I use ordinary mineral spirits, nothing special, just right from the hardware store. I used to use, you know, all the little 10, $20 little bottles of whatever thinner, this, that, and the other. Um, I don't use turpentine anymore because I find that some turpentines are aggressive. Um, they're hot. You know, you put them on top of the acrylics, they can even lift the acrylic sometimes. Uh, and also, uh, they're proprietary mixtures, and so Grumbacher's, uh, you know, turpentine is not necessarily the same as Windsor and Newton's turpentine, which is not the same as Golden's turpentine, and the manufacturer will change their formula or reformulate the thing, so you buy a bottle, you use it up in three years, and you go to buy another bottle, and it's an entirely different formulation, and it works completely different, you gotta reteach yourself how to paint. So anyways, avoid all of that now. Ordinary hardware store mineral spirits. Yes. Well, your picture says odorless. Yeah. And so when I hear ordinary mineral spirits, I think of the stinky kind. 
Uh, I, I mean, this ordinary, as in, this is what I buy at Walmart. It's ordinary. I go there and so I buy it. Okay, so you're not, yeah. you prefer odorless or does it matter? I just prefer whatever comes in a big gallon. I mean, I, I have no preference on them. I don't, okay. don't want to be snarky or smart ass about it. I just really, it doesn't matter. It's just mineral spirits. Okay. Snarky alert. No, sir. Snarky alert. Uh, mineral spirits. I mean, you know, uh, the clean strip, and I don't think clean strip makes it unless it's now it's odorless. I mean, uh, and so anyways, mineral spirits. That's it. So, uh, again, managing our paint, uh, oil paints um, for palettes. Uh, what I use is uh, I use a white uh, Cool Whip uh, container. Uh, I think I've had this one for several years. Um, and uh, the, the bucket part of it will snap onto the lid, and I use the lid as the actual mixing palette. And uh, what I can do then is I can take that bucket, snap it onto the lid, makes an airtight seal, and uh, I can store the mixed colors in the refrigerator overnight. Uh, or if I'm going to be gone like for a week or something like that, you stick it in the freezer. And you bring it out and uh, let it sit and come back up to room temperature, and uh, it will help preserve the paints and so you don't have to remix the paint over and over again because you know, you're taking your time and you may spend a painting session painting a leg. You may come back tomorrow and do another painting session, painting the other pant leg, but you want to use the same color, you know, so you don't want to dry out on your palette. Uh, and then uh, to recycle this, you know, once the paint gets dry or whatever, you just take a palette knife, you scrape it off, you take some mineral spirits, and you just wipe it and clean it, and it's ready for the next time. So, nothing special there. Please? So, another thing with oil paints is they take a while to dry, so you need to protect the figure uh, from the dust in the air as the figure dries, as the paint dries on the figure. And uh, again, I just use a little recycled uh, clear plastic thing, and I have some uh, pink styrofoam, and I put a pin in the figure's uh, foot, and I stick it down in the styrofoam, and uh, I put a little clear thing over the top of it, and it just sits on my paint desk. You can do something more elaborate, obviously. You can have a, you know, a, you know a, Tupperware box or something like that. I mean, it doesn't matter. The point is, you just protect your figure uh, from the dust in the air uh, overnight in between painting sessions. It doesn't really matter how you do that. This is just easy, an easy way. Please. So, on to the actual <coughs> painting process. Undercoating with acrylics. Um, <clears throat> I'm using my sable liner brush. And uh, what I want to use is multiple thin coats of paint. And I want to build up the opacity of that paint on the figure uh, so that I'm not hiding the detail with a, a coat of paint that's too thick, but I also want the, the opacity, the color saturation uh, that I'm looking for. And to give you an idea on this particular figure, uh, on this side, you can see that's one coat of paint. Uh, the Vallejo paint mixed about one-to-one -one with the thinner, applied with the uh, sable liner brush, kind of flowed around. And you can see it goes on almost like a wash at, at, at that uh, thinning ratio. But uh, once it dries, the next coat of paint will not lift the, the underlying paint. And so you can lay another coat of paint over the top of it. And if it's not doesn't have the, the color saturation or the opacity that you want, you can lay up yet a third coat on top of it, or a fourth coat, or however much you want. Um, and uh, so, thin multiple coats. Uh, as you're painting with acrylics, take your brush and periodically go to whatever cleaning medium you use. I use a uh, a little a little uh, jar with uh, ordinary water, and I add in maybe an ounce or two of, uh, of uh, window cleaner, and I just take my brush and I just swish it around in there, and then I have another jar of just clean water, and I rinse it off in that, and I dry it off on a paper towel, and then I go back to painting. Because what you want to do is, as you're painting with acrylics, the paint is going to start to dry in the tip. And as it dries in the tip, it glues those, those bristles together. When the bristles become glued together, the paint will no longer flow through the bristles by capillary action. So you're, not, you're no longer gonna be able to flow that paint where you want it to go. 
So as you're painting, if you notice that your paint is, is, is not going on smoothly and easily, clean your brush. And really, what you should do is just get into kind of a rhythm. You know? So you use three or four uh, brush loads of paint, rinse the brush off real quick, and then go back to painting. And if, and if you have your, your painting area set up, you can do that very quickly, and you, you, have a, you, you establish a habit of doing it, and it doesn't really uh, take as long as it sounds like to explain. But if you allow that paint to, to start to dry on the tip of the bristles, what will happen is you'll try to push harder and harder on the bristles to, to get the paint to flow. Because what you're now trying to do, instead of having the paint flow off the tip of the bristle, you're trying to get the paint to flow off between the bristles on the side. And so you're applying more and more pressure. And, and then all of a sudden what will happen is you'll apply enough pressure, and then the, the paint that's clumped up in the bristles Will, will release, and now all of a sudden you get the paint floods onto the uh, surface, uh, which is not what you want. So you want the paint to flow off the very tip in a controlled fashion, and if it's not doing that, you need to clean your brush. Next. So, when I'm doing my uh, acrylic undercoating, uh, I also undercoat everything. I paint all the details with the acrylic colors, and I also block in um, most of the insignia uh, that I'm going to paint onto the figure as well. I also do all the detail painting with uh, acrylics. And uh, so basically I'm painting the figure twice. Um, so to do insignia, uh, this is a technique that uh, your tabletop war gamers uh, use a lot. And uh, so it's very common, if you want to do some more research on this, uh, there's a ton of information available for acrylic painters on how to do this. But basically, establish the, the size and the shape of the insignia using little dots, and then connect the dots and, and fill it in with the paint. It's quite simple, actually, uh, once, you, once, you, once you've figured out what you're doing. And then doing that allows you to make the insignia symmetrical, one side to the other side. This one's the same size as this one, the same size on this figure. So you just establish those little reference points, and then connect the little reference points with uh, a line of paint, and then fill in, rather than you know try to paint it you know, perfectly every time. Here you can see uh, the dots and the filling in process. And uh, by undercoating uh, these uh, insignia shapes, when I go back to paint them with oils later, after I blend the uniform item, I can go back and take a brush uh, moistened with uh, mineral spirits, take that uniform color off the top of the insignia, and then I can go back in with oil paints and, and paint the insignia over it. I'm not trying to put a lot of paint on to overcome the darkness of the uniform color to get the brightness of the insignia. So, next. So, here's the figure fully <coughs> undercoated. On some places, uh, the undercoat uh, or acrylic undercoats will probably form uh, very nearly the uh, final color coats on the figure. Uh, but uh, for the rest of the figure, I'm going to repaint that with oils. Okay, so one other thing we got to talk about before we can get to actual painting. A little bit of a theory on the lights and shadows. Uh, we paint in the shadows and the highlights on figures because we have to overcome the effect of scale lighting. And uh, so we need to understand where those shadows and highlights should be on the figure in order to correctly place them. So that the figure looks natural in the lighting that uh, we're viewing it in. And so a little bit of understanding on, on how shadows are formed. You know, we have the main highlight here because that's the center of the light. And uh, then we have the, the really dark shadows, the terminator, the halftone, occlusion shadows, and things like that. Again, yeah, kind of beyond the scope of, of this, except my advice to you if you want to learn to paint figures well is to study this. Um, so that you understand how the lighting works, and understanding how lighting works allows you to then translate that to understanding how to paint in those shadows and highlights. Okay, next. So we can boil most of that down using Shepard Payne's classic stop sign. You guys uh, all are probably familiar with that. If not, um, you know, way back when, Shepard Payne with his uh, tips on building dioramas that came with monogram uh, models, and then he moved on to the, you know, the, the book uh, on uh, building dioramas. I think he, he published a book on painting figures. 
And uh, this is how he uh, explains it. You know, you have your strongest highlight, your medium highlight, your basic color, your medium shadow, and your strongest shadow. So you, you're basically working sort of, a, you know, in four different tones of the same color. And it, it's a very easy, easy, easy thing to, to get your head around. So let's, let's look at it just a little bit more uh, in depth, though. Next slide. So now let's take the stop sign and turn it inside out. Because, you know, on the, on the on a fold of cloth going outwards, we have a stop sign going this way. But as the fold of cloth goes in, we have a, fold of, we have a stop sign that's inside. So if we turn the stop sign inside out, we see the strongest shadow is on the top or the inside of the top, the medium shadow, the basic shadow, the medium highlight, and the strongest shadow, uh, the strongest highlight. And this is important to understand. The strongest highlight is here, and the strongest shadow is here. The strongest shadow is not here. Next slide. Okay? The shadow is here. It's not here. The highlight is here. It's not here. And... If you want to paint well, and again, I don't, I don't want to patronize anybody here, but if you want to paint well, washes and dry brushing will only get you so far. And, and, if, and if you want to paint well, you need to progress beyond washes and highlights. Even if you're going to paint with acrylics, acrylic painters put their, put their shadows and highlights here. Like this. Taste on harms, paints like this. You don't paint with washes and, and dry brushing. So even if you're an acrylic painter, it's still worth it. This is just as important to you as if you're going to paint with the hobby enamels or oils. So if you put a wash on this, the wash is going to settle here. If you dry brush, the highlight is going to be here. And so your shadows and highlights are never going to be quite where they're supposed to be. So, anyways, any questions about that? Moving on. Enough of uh, that. So, oil painting basics. If you've never worked with oil paint, uh, again, oil paint is a mixture of pigment and lean seed <coughs> or sunflower seed oil. That's all it is, pigment and oil. I mean, you dry, buy dry pigments for weathering, that's the pigment that's in the oil paint. You mix some uh, binder and thinner with it, you make paint. Uh, student oils, they have coarser pigments generally than uh, finer artist quality oils, but not necessarily. Um, and for most painting, it doesn't really matter. The oil acts as both a carrier and a binder. I'm sorry, what was that? Somebody had a comment? You're in the hall. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so the oil acts as both a carrier and a binder when it dries. So the oil dries out, and that's what sticks the pigment onto the surface, as opposed to some other paint formulations where you have a separate binder, um, which actually is the glue, if you will, that glues the pigment onto the surface, and the thinner uh, is a carrier that makes all of that liquid enough to work with. On oil paints, generally speaking, if they come out of the tube, you don't have a carrier per se, you just have oil. So the oil works as both a carrier and a binder. So you can use the same oils for figure painting, washes, and color modulation. So it's an economical thing that matters. <coughs> Student or uh, beginning uh, sets of oil are a good way to incorporate a lot of different colors into your oil painting palette or pit box, if you will, at a relatively low price. So if you're just trying to get into oil painting, um, you know, you may want to go and spend some money on some, you know, some quality oil paints or, you know, larger tubes of oil paint. Um, but then, you, you know, you may not want to go spend a lot of money on just a, a tube of, uh, you know, Alizarian crimson, you know, when you're ever going to own, only use a, a pinprick of it, you know, so you can get that out of a, or a student set for 12 bucks with 25 colors from Walmart on sale. And quality is generally uniform across brands. There's really not much difference in the quality of Grumbacher oil paint or Windsor Newton oil paint or Roland oil paint or anybody else's oil paint for that matter. Um, the difference in quality is usually within the brand when they go from professional quality to hobby product quality to student quality. And a lot of times that difference is uh, on the price tag and not inside the tube. So you just want to shop around. <laughs> so, oil painting rules. Unthin paint can be painted on top of other unthin paint. Uh, thin paint can be put on top of uh, other unthin paint, but unthin paint cannot be applied over thin paint. 
And the point of all of that is a heavier consistency paint won't stick to the lighter consistency paint. So if you mixed up a color and you've applied it to your figure, and then you go to apply a second color on top of that for whatever reason, and that second color won't come off the brush, it's not because the paint is bad, it's because probably the paint that's on the figure already is too thin to allow the, the heavier consistency paint on your brush to be pulled off onto it. So you've either got to let that uh, unthin or thin consistency paint dry out some, or you need to thin the uh, heavier consistency paint so it'll go on top of it. So it's, a, it's, just, a, it's just a thing that uh, a, lot of, a lot of beginning oil painters they, they run into, it's, it's a common problem, they'll run into it if you, you paint with oil before, then you're okay, you won't, you won't have a problem. If you never paint with oil, it's like, oh my God, my paint's horrible, it's not working, or whatever. No, it's just, yeah. you're here. You're here in Ghostbuster land. Okay, <laughs> next, next, uh, next slide. So, moving on, more stuff. Uh, generally, and this is for all painting, uh, paint from the inside out, so that, you know, uh, you didn't paint this, and then you tried to reach down in here and paint this, and you got paint all over that. So start in here, and work your way up, paint that, then paint that, then paint that. And that way, you're not uh, getting paint over. It's, it's just easier process. You're not getting paint on, on things that you've already painted. Um, but that's just a general rule. Uh, it's not a hard and fast rule. It just generally works better that way, but not always. Next slide. So if we go with that, then that gives us a general painting sequence inside out, we're going to do faces and hands first, collars, cuffs, and hats, uniforms, and the belts, the straps that are on top of the uniform, and then belts and straps, when you're doing those, you need to look at the way they're layered so that you're painting this belt before you paint this belt, and then this belt is the last one that you paint. So if you try to paint this one, and then paint this one, you're going to get paint on the one you just painted. And then the final details. It's logic, but something to keep in mind. Next. So, again, the thing that everybody's afraid with with oil painting is how do I mix the colors? Uh, I suggest that uh, if you want to do oil painting, you go out and you buy a color wheel um, at the local craft store or the big bookstore or something like that. Um, but it's really very basic. I mean, you know, hey, you only got three primary colors and uh, everything comes from that. It's not, again, it's not rocket science. Uh, they've, been, they've been doing this for, you know, centuries. So we have uh, black, yellow, red, and white uh, make khaki. So one black, two yellow, one red, eight white. will make us a pretty good khaki color. Uh, change the ratios just a little bit. Black, yellow, and red, olive drab. Black and yellow, olive green. Field gray, black, yellow, red, and white. Oh, wait, that's the same as khaki. Uh, almost the same as khaki, you just change the ratio. So <clears throat> you see a pattern? It's really quite simple. If you want to do modern uniforms, you're really looking at black, yellow, red, and white. And you're just going to mix them in some different proportions to, to create most of the colors that you're going to use. So, that right here. Four colors. Black, yellow, red, and white. Make just about every color from light tan to dark field gray. Well, when I, I see the oil paints at the art store, they've got five or six different shades of yellow. Sure, sure. Myself, so. Well, uh, you, you. again, Again, that kind of goes back to uh, money. Chrome yellow costs a lot of money because the pigment that goes into chrome yellow is chromium. And chromium is an expensive rare earth. So a large tube of chromium paint, not even a large tube, a tube of chromium paint next to a tube of yellow ochre, the chromium paint will probably cost, chrome yellow paint will probably cost four, maybe even five times as much as that tube of yellow ochre paint. So what they'll do is they'll add, for example, they'll add white to it, titanium white to the chrome yellow, and they'll call it sunburst yellow. And they can charge you half the price for sunburst yellow as they do for a tube of chrome yellow. And so, for example, with, with, with that, that's what you have a lot of times. Yeah, what about like lemon yellow, cadmium yellow? Like yeah, I mean, it's just it really, really, the yellow for this, I use cad yellow, um, because that's, that's the basic, yellow pigment that's in almost every variety or variation of yellow. And so you can add white to that, or you can add red to that, or you can add ochre or, or umber or whatever to it to, to vary the color. So if you want yellow, then you know chromium yellow will give you a pure yellow, and then from there you can get anywhere else you want to go. 
So you don't, but you don't necessarily need a huge tube of it, but it will last forever. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I won't spend a lot of time on color mixes. Again, we can, we can, we can spend three hours on this, mixing colors, yeah. But the, the point is that mixing colors with oils is not that hard, honestly. It's really not. If I can do it, everybody in this room can do it. Everybody in this building can do it. Okay, so next one. So, the basic technique that we're going to use once we've got the figure uh, undercoated with acrylics is we're going to paint the oils on to establish the final colors and the highlights and the shadows. And the blending technique that we're going to use for that is called color blocking. And this is where we're really getting radically different than uh, acrylic paint. Acrylic painters can't color block because acrylic paints won't blend, generally speaking. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to lay down the first color, say for example, uh, a shadow. Then we're going to lay down the second color, maybe our basic shade. And next slide. Then we're going to blend between them to establish that transition between the highlight and the shadow. You guys already are, you, you already know this. It's color block, the blended area. Next slide. So, <clears throat> to see how this actually works, uh, we're going to violate the, the general sequence of painting so that I can show you an example of a large uniform area. Uh, and in this case, we're going to uh, do look at the pant leg because it gives us a large area to look at so you can see the mechanics of the blending process. But this is not actually how I normally paint. But we're going to reverse that because the blending process on small things is the same. It's just smaller, but it's harder to see and understand unless you've got the big picture. So we're going to look at the big picture first. Next. Okay, go ahead and uh, start this. We have the lights on. And I don't know if you guys can see this or not. <coughs> but we're going to work on the left pant leg. And so, it's difficult to the show but okay there we go so I'm gonna start by blocking in the deep shadows so I've mixed up my uh, my kind of olive green color this is a Canadian Commonwealth figure Canadian uniforms a little greener than the uh, British uniforms uh, just because of you know the manufacturing process and the dyes used uh, and uh, so I mixed up my basic uniform color and uh, to that basic uniform color I've added uh, some raw umber, I believe, in this case. And uh, so I blocked in the dark, the darkest shadows, and now I'm blocking in what will be my medium shadows. Okay, now I've turned the figure upside down uh, quite often in order to block in those shadows on the bottoms of the folds, not inside the fold necessarily, but on the, on the bottom of the fold will be the darkest shadows. So here we are, blocked in, and now we're going to blend. And the blending, I'm using a, most of it is a stippling motion with the very tip of the bristles. And by that stippling motion, what I mean is I'm taking the bristles of the brush and I'm, I'm, I'm jabbing at the surface like this. I'm not really trying to do this. I'm, 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 I'm blending like this. I'm, I'm dancing the, the, just the very tips of those bristles along that, that line between those two colors. The, the, you know, the first color I blocked in and the second color I blocked in. The darkest shadows and the medium <coughs> shadows. Have you had normal spirit on the brush for this? No, no. That's a good question. For this, you want your brush to be dry. It doesn't necessarily have to be dry. You, you can transition from blocking in the colors and then wipe off the paint. Just simply wipe the paint off the brush. Don't clean the brush. Don't run it into thinners. Wipe it off. I've blended the darkest shadows and the medium shadows, and I'm blocking in the midtones. And now remember now, if we go back to our Shepherd Payne 
stop sign, our mid-tones are, what are, are the colors that are probably on the very outsides of those folds, right? Another thing you want to do is, because we've blocked this in, or undercoated this with the acrylics, we can use a very, very small amount of oil paint yeah. to get this color on here. Now, we've taken a round brush, and I've taken that round brush, and I've, I've cleaned the paint off of it, basically with the, my fingertips, and I've made the brush from round, I've made it like this, like a little chisel. So now I can take those bristles, and if I need to, to, to blend along a, a, a narrow line, I can blend this way. If I want to blend across a wider area, I can blend this way. So pinch the paint off, the excess paint off the brush, because we want, in the end of this process, we want as little paint on that figure as possible, but still establishing the color. So we don't want to, we don't want to obscure detail with blob on paint. And that's, a, that's another thing that, uh, People who are painting with oils for the first time tend to try to put too much paint on the figure. So use just a little bit of paint and brush it out with the bristles to establish the blocking and then wipe the excess off the brush and then blend. And again, you're using a stippling motion for the blending. Sometimes you might want to brush out the marks and you want to smooth the transition by brushing along the line. But 90% of it, you're blending like this. You're just using the very tips of those bristles. And once those bristles load with paint, take the brush and wipe the, the, the paint off. Pinch the paint off the tip of the bristles of the brush or the, the brush. And uh, you know, yeah, you'll wind up with a little paint on your fingers. Um, and you may want to use a different technique. You know, some people will take a folded cloth and they'll stick the brush under a folded cloth and they'll pull the brush through it like that. And that works perfectly well. Paper towel will do the same thing. Me, I just I just pinch it off with my fingers just because my hands are full and I don't want to spend too much time doing it. So here's the highlights added. And again, we're blending, we're, we're stippling, we're, 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 we're taking the, that brush along that line between the two blocked in colors or the second blocked in color, what's underneath it now are blended colors, the, the dark shadows, the medium shadows, the basic color, and now we're adding the highlight on top of the basic color and we're blending that in. And again, just using that stippling motion. Pinch the paint off the tip. Establish that little chisel shape. So you have, you have a narrow working area and you have a wide working area. And that's really important when you start getting down into the detail blending. And you want to detail blend on something that's really small. You want that really narrow uh, bristle tip, which is, which is even finer than the, the, the tip of the paint, uh, the bristles when it was you know, around the brush. <coughs> Generally speaking, you want to use the largest brush possible for all of your painting, too. So, you know, you may start off with the basic color blocking. You may start off using a, uh, a number zero or number one. And, uh, you know, by the time you get down to doing some of the detail work, you're using a much smaller brush. But you don't want to use a much smaller brush for the big blocking. You want to use the largest brush possible because the largest brush possible will give you the fewest brush strokes. Uh, on the figure. It, it makes the figure painting neater. Again, stipple, stipple, stipple. Stipple, stipple, stipple. Wipe it off. <clears throat> See how often I'm wiping the brush off? Stipple, stipple, stipple. Wipe the brush off. I'm actually removing excess paint. Because as careful as I was, I still put too much paint on the figure. More paint than I want on the figure. So as that brush uh, loads up with the paint, we take it and we remove the paint from the brush. Okay, next, next slide. 
So let's look at this exact same process on a small detail. Go ahead and run it. Here we're going to paint the, the bag, the holder for the uh, entrenching tool. So here it is. This is the, the basic acrylic color, the undercoat acrylic color. So blocking in the deep shadows. I think this is a, um, it's an equivalent to about a, a, a 100 O brush. And I think it's an army painter insane detail or psycho detail brush or something like that. So adding in those, those really dark shadows, blocking them in. And you'll notice if you look carefully, you can actually see the, the color of the bristles back here. So you can see I haven't loaded the, that brush up with paint all the way to the ferrule. I only have paint in the tips of the bristles. You use an optivisor. I do. I do. I need an optivisor to stand here looking at this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now we're going to block in the medium shadows. It's the same process as with the pant leg, but you know we're working at a much smaller area. This is, this is very, very little, again, very, very little, I can't emphasize enough. The smallest amount of paint possible. You can't put too little paint on the figure. <clears throat> okay. And I believe we're getting ready to do some blending. There we go. Again, we're using that stippling motion with the very tip of the brush. Stippling motion with the very tip end of the brush. Lock in the, the basic colors, the mid-tone. And again, note on this detail, with this mid-tone, I'm not blocking it in on areas where I'm eventually going to have this, the highlights and the super highlights. Uh, it may get blended onto those areas, but we don't want to necessarily and deliberately put paint on those areas because this detail is so small that we just kept putting paint and paint and paint on it we have to remove most of it in order to not, not hide the detail. And now we're going to blend, blend the medium shadow into the uh, mid-tone color. Yes? Do you let the figure dry at all in between like your shadows? versus your highlights, so you're doing all this within, you know, 15, 20 minute range. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good question. It, it's, it's not a 15 or 20 minute range, but no, I don't let anything dry in between. What I do is I try to sequence my painting sessions so that I can finish a, a specific thing at one time, like the pant leg. I painted this figure, I painted the, the front of the pants, well, actually I think I painted the back, I painted the back of this one pant leg first. In one painting session. The next day I went and I painted the front of the pant leg. The next day I went and painted, I think I painted the entire pant leg the next day. So no, and, and you don't want the paint to dry too much uh, because then you can't blend it. Um, although there is there's a, a long working time and uh, on the larger scale figures, bust and, and things like that, you have enough paint that the paint won't dry maybe overnight and will allow you to go tomorrow and keep painting in that same area and blend in that same area. But on the 135 scale figure, generally speaking, if you set this figure aside overnight, what you've painted on it today will be too dry to blend tomorrow. Not 100%, not but there's a general rule of thumb. So try to 
sequence your painting session so that you accomplish you know, an, an entirety of, of whatever the sub subtask is before you, you know, you stop your painting session. So, so the issue that I've had in the past with doing both highlights and shadows all at once is that the figure starts to look kind of muddy, right? Like all the colors kind of start blending into one and you're kind of losing your shadows and losing your highlights. Right. And it just kind of starts to look muddy after a while. Um, I've traditionally just let like the shadows dry mm -hmm. and then go back the next day maybe and do the highlights to help prevent that. If, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, if, that, if that works for you, if you, you kind of got that timing and the sequencing down, then there, that's an absolutely 100% valid technique to use. I mean, that's, I, would, I would never argue uh, uh, against doing that. I, what I have learned to do, or what I try to do, is I try to use as little paint as possible, and I try to keep that blending just between the two block colors, and I, and I blend that transition area, and I, and, and I try not to blend too far so that I, I carry that shadow into another area. So I, I try to avoid that muddy, uh, muddy everything turns the same color um, effect by, by being more selective. In so that goes back to chiseling the brush, essentially. Yeah, I mean, fine, it's... Fine, it, fine lines. Yeah, it's, it's like on this. Um, you know, again, like I didn't put the midtones here on the areas where I was going to put the highlights. I, I concentrated the blending of the, the midtone shadow, uh, the uh, medium shadows and the midtones in this area, and then I added the highlights, and then and it blended that just right along that, that little t tiny line right there, so that I didn't get the shadow down into, into this area. Now on the the super highlights, the really small highlights, because the area is so small, it's difficult to not have any paint on that area already. So now what I've done is I've put the super highlight directly on top of that last uh, mid-tone that I added. Um, and I did, I actually, uh, while I was talking, I don't know if you saw, but I went and I added in the video, I added more mid-tone onto it to compensate for uh, any overblending that I had already done. So, um, I generally don't allow the paint to dry overnight or anything like that. But I mean, that's that's a, it is a technique, and a lot of a lot of figure painters that paint larger scale figures do a lot of that. Um, they they'll paint uh, you know they'll they'll paint the same area over multiple sessions because they can still work with the paint. Now this may seem uh, uh, to be a violation of that kind of stippling uh, technique rule or whatever, uh, and perhaps it is, um, but what I really wanted to do was these, these folds, the tops of these folds are so small that I didn't want to over blend that super highlight and lose the shadows next to them. So I did, I did do some very light uh, blending uh, by, by brushing along the, the line there. What was your paint ratio again for this? This is just just straight oil paint. Straight I, I have not the oil paint has not been okay, the oil paint has not been thin here at all. Okay. The oil paint has not been thin. Mm -hmm. If I need to thin it or clean the brush, I'll use mineral spirits. But but this is just straight oils, right out of the tube, blended on the palette. Um, I don't take my oils. I don't put them on an absorbent palette to 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 draw out the excess uh, oil. Um, because I, I'm used to working with them like this, so that may help uh, if, you, if you, you know, if that's a technique that you've been using in the past, maybe with color modulation or something like that, that you've been putting your oils on cardboard or something like that to draw out the excess oil, uh, and just leave a, a, a heavier body, uh, pig, a heavier pigmented body of paint behind. If that works for you, um, and you're used to working that way, then there's no reason not to try to transition that to your figure paint. So. There are some uh, alternative methods to doing this, uh, and here is one of them. Uh, we can uh, block in the shadows uh, using a wash. I don't have a video for this, I just have a series of uh, photos. But uh, basically we started with a white primer, we undercoated it, and here the undercoating I, I uh, deliberately uh, did not apply um, uh, as many I think this is maybe only two coats instead of three or four. Because you can still see it, it still kind of has a, a kind of has a wash look to it a little bit. Um, because that helped me uh, visualize the, the shadows and the highlights a little better on 
this really bright background. Because I wanted this uniform to be light khaki when I got done with it. I didn't want it to be too dark. So uh, I added a raw umber wash. So now to your question, that raw umber wash was made with raw umber oil paint mixed with mineral spirits. And there's no particular ratio that I did that with. I took one of those little cups, I put a blob of oil paint in it, and I added an eyedropper full of uh, mineral spirits, and I stirred it up, and that was how much I had. Uh, and then if I wanted something with more pigment concentrated, I just dipped further down into the, to the goo. So I added the wash, and then uh, I allowed the thinners to evaporate, which takes, how long it takes? 20 minutes, 30 minutes, half an hour? You know, go have a sandwich and come back? I don't know. It just takes a little bit of time, though, um, until it's not shiny and, and, and just soppy wet. But. And then I took a brush, moistened with mineral spirits, and I removed the excess raw umber wash <coughs> off of all the areas where I did not want the darkest shadows. Okay? Then I blocked in my mid-tones using straight oil paint and blended them. And so basically I took the oil paint, I thinned it, I allowed capillary action to put it where I wanted it, I removed the excess, I allowed the thinner to dry out, and then when the thinner dried out, what was left <coughs> was raw umber oil paint as if I put it on with a brush down in all those little cracks. So this is kind of a fast way to sort of beat the system, if you will. But then from here, with the mid-tones blocked in, the blending between that umber oil paint and the mid-tone was done exactly the same way as in the uh, video, stippling along the edge, because the, oil, the raw umber oil paint is still wet, so we can blend it with the mid-tone. Uh, next slide. Added the highlights, blended them, did the seams and the edges, blended those, added the super highlights and blended those, and the super highlights here were almost just straight titanium white added on top of the basic uh, uh, khaki color and blended straight through. And, you know, the final result. And I got the variation in tone between the jacket and the pants and the helmet by varying the, the actual color of the undercoat. So I started off with a, a darker, more intensive uh, khaki color for the pants, a, a little lighter color for the jacket, and then uh, I can't remember what I did on the hat. Um, but anyways, that allowed me, once I, I used the same color oil paints on top of those, that the, 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 the color of the uh, undercoat is complementing the oil paint. Next. So, this, this technique though, that I just showed you is how I paint faces. And uh, I've been through a lot of different uh, face painting uh, genres. And, uh, and then I hit on this one that Mark Bannerman describes in this book. And uh, it was, uh, I don't know, it was not necessarily an epiphany, but it was like, oh, okay, that's, that's so easy. Why, why, why hadn't I been doing it that way all along? So next slide, please. So. The thing with faces and hands, the thing to remember is they're really, really, really small. Mm. And if we go back to the idea of putting the least amount of paint on the figure that we, that we can achieve the effect with, then when we're going with smaller and smaller details, we need less and less and less paint. And so the technique that I showed you with the khaki uniform, where we establish the dark shadows with a wash, allows us to use a very, very small amount of the darkest shadow color pigment and put it where we want it and, and then go from there. And you'll see how this works. Um, so uh, flesh color, flesh is easy. Uh, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, titanium white, approximately two to one to four, but it ain't rocket science. And in fact, uh, to vary the tone of the skin color, a guy's more ruddy complexion, uh, you know, perhaps uh, ethnic uh, skin tone, uh, Native American, um, you, know, the, uh, you know, the China doll, uh, Caucasian girl, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, and really fair skin. Uh, it's all the exact same three colors, just simply varying the ratios. 
And so, huh, voila, poof, it's magic. You mix those three together and you get flesh. And then uh, we'll use a little burnt umber for shadows. Burnt umber, not raw umber. Burnt umber, any of the burnt colors, they're called burnt because they're redder, not because they burned the pigment or something. It's burnt umber because it's a reddish shade of umber as opposed to raw umber, which is a really dark, blackish brown color. So burnt umber is kind of a reddish brown color. Uh, Payne's gray, uh, one of those violations of the rules of don't buy every color in the book because I can't think of any way to mix up a gray color that actually looks like Payne's gray. So Payne's gray is Payne's gray. And Alizarin crimson, uh, again, and uh, Alizarin crimson and Payne's gray are good to maybe pick up in a student oil set or something like that. You don't need a lot of them, but when you need them, that's the exact right color. Next slide, please. Okay, so. Basic face painting technique. Uh, you'll see this uh, on the video. We're going to undercoat. We're going to put a wash on. We're going to remove the excess wash. We're going to add mid-tones. We're going to blend. Poof. And we're going to add the details. Poof. Next slide. All right. So go ahead and uh, start this up. You'll see how this works. And, and it's the same technique that I was showing you with that khaki uniform. We're going to use that same blending technique, painting technique, on the actual face. So here's the burnt umber uh, oil paint, and there's a little puddle of uh, mineral spirits. I'm gonna mix up the wash. You see it's uh, extraordinarily technical. I'll, I'll provide the formula later. <laughs> you can never remember it, not in a million years. And uh, <clears throat> you can be a lot more selective when you do this than I was in the, uh, the video. Um, here I, I I put the wash on everywhere so that I would have enough wash to take off to show you how it works. But um, you really don't need to put the wash on quite this heavily. It's, it's actually better to not put the wash on places that you know you don't want any dark color. But so anyways, there's the wash. It's, it's the mineral spirits have evaporated out. Now I take that brush, and that brush is, is, is moist. It's not wet, but it's moist with mineral spirits. So it's just... Run it in the mineral spirits and dry it off on a paper towel, and what's left is moist enough. Yes, sir. So, sorry, I missed this. What's the base color of the figure then? <clears throat> it's a, it's a, uh, an acrylic it color, it? and I think that that might be uh, something like Iraqi sand, Vallejo Iraqi sand. Okay, so um, you are, you are. Um, yes, it's, okay. yes, it's undercoated with acrylics. Okay. So, so what you see there, except for the oil paint that I'm taking off right now, is all acrylic. The hat's uh, undercoated with acrylics. The, the brown hair was uh, undercoated with acrylics, the flesh was undercoated with acrylics, and uh, I vary the acrylic undercoat color for the skin tones in order to achieve variations in the colors of the skin tones of various figures on a piece of work, so all the guys don't look like they're twin brothers. And I do that by varying the acrylic undercoat color, so I use citadel elf flesh, uh, citadel dwarf flesh, citadel bronze flesh, uh, Vallejo uh, Iraqi sand, Vallejo flesh. Uh, Reaper makes about four different flesh colors. Um, you use all of those various acrylic flesh colors. You paint, you know, half a dozen guys, and every one of them is painted with an undercoat with a slightly different acrylic color. When you paint them with the oils, they'll all come out with a little bit of variation in their uh, their skin tone. So, anyways, I'm just just taking that moist brush though, and uh, removing. The, uh, the excess wash. And you see how that acrylic paint allows me to do that. It just allows me to just, just it's, like, it's like that brush has, a, a, has a, a magnet in it and it's just sucking that pigment away. But really, it's, it's just cleaning it off. Capillary action draws that, uh, draws that paint right back up into the brush. So, we're gonna block in the basic flesh tone. That's the basic flesh tone that I mixed up in the previous slide. Yes, sir. You just went straight into this and let it dry a little bit? Nope, 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 nope. Uh, we allowed it to dry out for the mineral spirits to dry out <coughs> so that uh, when we went to uh, remove the excess umber. Right. Um, but by the time we get to this point, all we have left is yeah. the umber pigment so, and oil. So the, the dark okay. shadows are just essentially raw umber yeah. oil paint. Cool. This, that's been applied and that's all that's there. So this is, this is just a straight uh, flesh color. 
And you'll notice uh, a variation with the uh, uniform, and now I am blocking this in everywhere that I don't have the dark shadow. Um, and you'll see why I'm doing that uh, a little bit later. But we're going to block in everywhere that we don't have the uh, raw umber. We're going to block it in with basic clay. I think that's a... Uh, What size is that? That's a. It's about that big. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna be, be smart ass about it. Uh, serious question. I'm sorry. Figure painters ask serious questions. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I think it's a. I'll edit that know, out. It's, it's a zero maybe, or a, or a two o, and it's a Windsor uh, Newton, uh, Series Seven Red Sable. And uh, it's the same brush, and now I'm blending, and you'll notice that stippling motion. We're not smearing it around, we're just stippling along the edges. And doing this, I'm going to create the, I'm going to leave the, the deepest shadows and I'm going to blend from the edge of the deepest shadow out into the flesh tone area, the medium shadow color. So I'm, I'm creating the medium shadow by blending the raw umber into the basic flesh color right on the figure, as opposed to blocking in a, a, a dark shadow and a medium shadow and then blending those. That's what I used to do. And this is a thousand times easier and faster. I used to, I used to block it all in and blend it. And that's the way that it, 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 you go back to the Shepherd Paint example, if you remember those tips on building dioramas and had that, that diagram of the human face and it had it all drawn out, kind of like the contour map with the different colors. And that's exactly how I used to paint. And, it, and, it, and I thought I was pretty effective. And I was more or less pleased with the results that I got. But this is, I don't say it was an epiphany, but it was like, holy shit. It's <laughs> so much easier. You see how the brush, the brush is, is, is doing that from, from using just the tips of the bristles to, to, to blend? So. Uh, we've created the uh, dark shadows and the mid-tone uh, shadows. Now, back to your question about uh, you know the, the, the muddying effect. You see how that's kind of muddy? What I'm going to do now is I'm going to add additional basic flesh on top of the places where I want that mid-tone. And I'm going to blend that in. And uh, that's going to help me reestablish the mid-tones so that I, uh, so that I uh, recover from that over-blending. So now I think I've switched brushes. I think this is back to uh, one of those Army Painter uh, red sable brushes, and this may be the uh, Army Detailer brush or the uh, Psycho Detailer. I can't remember which is which. But one of them is, is about a 100-0 brush, and the other one is about a, a 50-0. And uh, there, I hate, I hate to give a, a plug and not get any uh, conversations. Where, where is this guy? Yeah, where are, the, where are those guys? Army Painter. Uh, they have a web, uh, Cool Mini or Not website. Cool Mini or Not. If you go to Cool Mini or Not, uh, they have a store. And the storefront on the website, you can go and you can buy the Army Painter brushes from their store. And they vend at a lot of shows. They vend down in Atlanta, which is where I normally buy my brushes from. And I'll buy a, a half a dozen of them from them. Uh, and they're relatively inexpensive, surprisingly. They're a very high quality brush. Uh, you do need to shop a little bit, maybe, you know, pull the little protective cap off and, and look and make sure the bristles are not bummed. Uh, but uh, they're not ex that terribly expensive. Um, so, I think here, what are we doing? Blending in, uh, looks like I'm blending in uh, a little bit more of the. Uh, the basic flesh into the uh, mid shadow color. Yeah. I didn't, see, I didn't see the capture on the slides. I can't remember what I was doing. So, but again, just, and you know how small the face is. So you can see that, 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 uh, that blending motion. So now to the highlights, we're not going to block in a separate highlight color. We're just simply going to take some pure titanium white, just teeny tiny little drops of pure titanium white. 
We put that right on top of the basic flesh color. And we're going to blend that in directly on the figure. <clears throat> and this is where it's really important to, as you're doing that blending, to take the brush aside and wipe the excess paint off the brush. Because if you don't, you will wind up with too much paint on the figure and it, it, it's impossible to control. So the vast majority of that white paint is going to go away in the blending process. But we want to avoid over blending around. So when I go to blend, I'm going to use the very tip of that bristle and I'm going to blend right down into that dot into the underlying paint. And I'm going to continuously take that paint away and wipe it off the brush. And then I'll clean up a little bit around the edges of that blended area to, to establish that transition. But you have to be careful so that you don't over blend and get white everywhere. Because you can do that. Just like with that, just like with that initial blending of the, the uh, raw umber, I'm sorry, the burnt umber and the uh, basic flesh color to establish the, the shadows. It's very easy to over blend this. So we want to continuously remove that paint. Still blocking in the uh, highlights. And here you can see I'm just going around the figure, taking the head, turning it, blocking in the colors, turning it, blocking in the colors, turning it, blocking in the colors, until I've got the white uh, blocked in on all my uh, highlight areas. And then I'll, I'll blend it all at once. You have plenty of working time. Lots of working time with this. You can do that. You can see how small those little tiny dots of paint are. Tendons on the back of the neck. So now we're going to blend them directly into the underlying mid-tone color. And again, just using that stippling motion, and we want to just we want to control where we're doing that blending. So that we don't over blend into our shadow areas or unnecessarily blend into our mid-tone areas. And again, notice how often, every time I do that, I, every time I, that brush disappears from the screen, I'm wiping it off. I'm wiping the paint off of it every time it disappears from the screen. <clears throat> Another thing, you can see that the head is uh, on a, uh, a straight pin uh, into a hole drilled in the neck and, I'm, and a pair of hemostats on the workbench. And I'm not holding the head. The head is just resting on the workbench. And the hand that's doing the painting, I'm actually bracing that hand with my other hand and I'm only using the, the fine motor muscle control for my fingers for the actual the actual painting. And if I need to, 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 to change the angle of the brush, what I will do is I will move the figure head and, and that way I'm, 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 this is constant. This is the constant on my workbench and then I change the work to change the angle of the brush. Rather than try to move around my workbench like this, I do this on the workbench and I move the figure around to get to the different areas. And so that, that, uh, that hemostat and that, that pin allows me to turn the head, move it around, rotate it, lift it up, turn it down, however. And so again, just blending those uh, highlights. <clears throat> You see how small the motions are. I mean, really, uh, again, it's, it's the obvious. But, you know, that, that little, the little part of the upper lip on that 135th scale figure is really small. So if you want to blend it, you, you have to really control what you're doing with the brush. So it, it matters the actual, the actual brushing technique.
Now, you, you may be thinking as you're watching this with all this white paint onto the basic flesh color that this guy is getting, he's looking a little pasty. He's, he's looking uh, like, uh, you know, an extra in uh, The Walking Dead. Um, so, we're going to fix that, though. We're going to warm all of this back up by going back to our burnt sienna. So, we've added white, titanium white, part of our basic flesh color mixture into our basic flesh to make it lighter. And now, to uh, warm it back up, we're going to add some of our burnt sienna. So, you know, the, the parts of the cheek, you know, where you, know, you have lots of those little capillaries, you know, and, and you know, a woman might blush or a guy might get a tan or whatever. <clears throat> so we just add in. And again, the same technique. We're just adding a little bit of straight uh, uh, burnt sienna right into or on top of the underlying basic flesh color. And again, just going to blend it in using the same stippling technique that I used with the titanium white and the uh, highlights. And it may look like I'm dragging the brush down, but, but you'll notice really what's happening is, is I'm stippling here and then moving the brush as I'm stippling it. So I'm, I'm stippling it and maybe dragging the bristles without, without moving the brush entirely, but the blending motion is in that is in the stipple, not the drag. Having said that, occasionally you do need to, you know, smooth out the brush marks and, uh, you know, smooth out the transition area a little bit. This is difficult to see in, in the video, but the guy has like these little worry lines on the top of his forehead, and that's, that's what I was doing. I was blending those sideways. And that was the, the exception to the rule um, where I, I used the bristles and I dragged the bris, uh, bristles across. Lower lip, uh, alizarin crimson and basic flesh to establish that color. And uh, then the, the, the little highlight is just a little dot of uh, titanium white right back on top of that. And if you need it darker, you know, under the edge, you just use a little more alizarin crimson. Excuse me. So, five o'clock shadow, you know, like over the lip and under the lip and then down alongside the, uh, the jaw. That's just some very, very small dots of Payne's gray. And it doesn't matter now whether we're going over a highlight, a shadow, or whatever. We're just gonna add that Payne's gray where we need it. Um, no, I won't say it doesn't matter whether it's over a highlight because you, know, you may not want to, to darken your highlights too much, but I'm just going to put that little bit of Payne's gray on. You can actually see it a little better on this side. Maybe. There we go. Wipe it off. And... Now we're going to blend it. We're going to blend it straight into the underlying color. And that's pretty much it for the basic face painting technique. And you can see uh, it takes you know, about as long as this video. A little bit longer, obviously, you know, but, but not a lot longer. So you can, you can paint a face fairly quickly uh, with this, this Bannerman technique, if you will. You say the eyes for last? Yeah. Say again? The eyes. I, I generally do save the eyes for last, um, and I, I didn't spend uh, any time putting them in here because that is a process that uh, <laughs> it, it takes a, a little bit longer to, uh, to, to show. But um, I, I paint whites and the uh, pupils and I go back in and, and redo the uh, upper lid and the lower lid. Um, and it, but it's pretty much the same methodology. It's just uh, an even smaller area. Um, I don't use straight white for the, the eyeball itself. I use uh, uh, 
uh, white generally mixed with a little Payne's gray, so uh, white with Payne's gray. The same for teeth. If you have the guy with teeth, you know, don't use, you know, give him that crest white smile. You know, <laughs> mix a mix a little yellow ochre with uh, you know your basic uh, or basic flesh color with the white, and uh, the contrast will, will be strong enough. It'll be obviously white teeth, uh, but, it, but it won't be that again. It won't be that little crest smile. Um, So, just getting in that uh, five o'clock shadow, and that's it. And but yes, I will do the uh, the eyes, uh, and then the uh, eyebrows and the hair and everything else. But, anyways, so uh, moving on, uh, leather items. I undercoat them with uh, a uh, acrylic paint. Uh, this is a uh, Citadel snake bite leather, and I think that's uh, I don't know another Citadel color. But anyways, they're, they're basically burnt sienna and raw sienna. And then uh, oil color, uh, oil paints over the top of them. Uh, black leather, I undercoat with a uh, brown so that uh, I can deliberately blend through a little bit and uh, allow some of that uh, raw leather color to, to show through and uh, give the black uh, a, a very distinctive brown color. Next. Uh, weapons and bare metal. Generally, I kind of cheat on all of this, and uh, I'll paint the uh, the weapon and the bare metal item. All, all of this is acrylics, and then over the top of that, I use a Payne's gray wash and an indigo wash and a burnt sienna wash on top of the uh, wooden furniture on the gun. Um, and this uh, this metallic color is uh, Vallejo rubber. And uh, Citadel uh, bolt gun metal, and I just vary the, the ratio between the two of them to get that uh, parkerized look. And then the indigo is is distinctly blue, so it gives kind of a polished blued look. And the Payne's gray kind of gives that that dark uh, parkerized look. So you get a little variety in the uh, in the metallic uh, colors, you know. So the details will show up a little better. Next, uh, wood. Again, just undercoat uh, the wood with acrylics, paint in the wood grain, give it a uh, oil wash. I generally use uh, burnt sienna or raw sienna, usually burnt sienna. And uh, the technique will work uh, not only on figures, but you know, it works on your vehicles. You know, these are uh, tools on a Sherman Firefly, and uh, they're painted exactly the same way. Everything is painted, undercoated with acrylics, and then uh, oil washes over the top of it. And that's all that it is for those, uh, those tools. Next, camouflage uniforms, a special case. Uh, everything is painted, I paint everything, with uh, acrylics. And then I use uh, oil washes and uh, a thin oil glaze, almost like a dry brushing. So it's you know one of those, oh, but you said don't dry brush, don't wash. Well, uh, I, there are a really accomplished uh, figure painters who can do all of that in uh, shadow and shade the, uh, the pattern as they're painting it. And uh, I confess that I'm not one of them. <laughs> uh, so, but the solid colors of the uniform are painted just like I, uh, I showed you earlier. Uh, undercoated with acrylics, uh, solid oil colors over the tops. Um, but you know, here I used uh, you know, thin oil paint um, and to do like the seam lines and, and some shadows. And uh, then I used uh, uh, almost a, a not titanium white, but titanium white with a little bit of green in it, uh, and then dry brushed over some of the tops of the, the folds, and you brush that out really thin, so it's just a it's just a, a semi-transparent glaze, almost a transparent glaze in the top. So okay, next. Uh, yeah, and again, the remainder of the figure is uh, painted with oils, faces, hands, other uniform items, all the rest of that stuff. All the white stuff is all oils, um, so you can you can use this technique uh, and, and get your uh, camouflage if you want. Uh, next, and so that's it. What are your questions? When you uh, did the uh, umber again, was that still the wash or was that regular color? Well, uh, on the uh, camouflage. On the face. On the face. Yeah, uh, that is that. Back in. Uh, that was straight oil. 
It was okay. a straight oil car, not not the wash. Okay, it took me a second to to, to, second. to rewind to rewind back to your question. But yes, when I went back in and uh, added in some stronger shadow lines, uh, mm -hmm. yes, that was uh, that was straight burnt umber, not raw umber, but burnt umber. Okay, straight burnt umber, the same color that I used on the actual wash that I removed. That burnt umber uh, is what I used for that. So yes, absolutely. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Very good, Mike. Thank you. Thank you.